did not refer to Marvin very often. I know it was your book and about your life and career, but why was that not so? Well, you will look over, you see a lot of people not referred to mm -hmm. in the book. It was generally in reference to people that I was engaged in in, mm -hmm. in the campaigns or in government. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, pretty uh, regular, uh, emphatic extent, mm -hmm. strong extent. And um, I wasn't involved uh, that way with former Governor Marvin Richard, mm -hmm. just like I wasn't with a lot of other people. That their names were not included in there. What about... Uh, I don't believe Tamage was in there. Right. I don't believe uh, Walter George was in there. <laughs> well, uh, how would you describe your relationship uh, and your acquaintances with uh, Marvin? I know he has supported you in, in certain elections and so forth. I think they're excellent. And I believe they've always been. I believe they're good. I think Marvin Griffin is one of the most strong type individuals that we've had on the Georgia scene, maybe in the history of the state. Mm -hmm. uh, he was willing to say what he thought he ought to say and, uh, and do what he thought he ought to do. And I think certainly as governor and before and after, proven to be one of the most colorful people, figures we've ever known in our state. And uh, everybody knew of uh, Marvin Griffin, uh, the people who supported him and the people who did not support him, they all knew of Marvin Griffin, and they all, I believe, formed some kind of opinion <laughs> of Marvin Griffin. And I'm glad that Marvin Griffin got to be governor of our state, and uh, glad that I got to meet and know him. You mentioned in your book. I supported him in both of his campaigns. The one when he won, the one when he lost. You uh, mentioned your book used to cater sometimes uh, to the governor's mansion. Uh, what was that like? What, what, uh, how does one feel when they when they cater? You put that out in bids or something? The only time I ever catered to the governor's mansion was when Marvin Griffin was governor. And I had calls from the mansion, and I talked with Mrs. Griffin in reference to the catering and even met with her one or once or twice to mention in reference to the catering. He, uh, he put on a big function for his uh, uh, World War II military buddies mm -hmm. to mention. They had quite a thing going there. Uh, they would ask, ask me for a price and I would give them a price and then give me the order. And of course, I always had reasonable prices, just like I do today. And uh, I thought it was great that uh, little old Lester Maddox, running a small restaurant on Hempfield Avenue at the time, would get an opportunity to, to go to the mother, uh, governor's mansion, and especially to serve the governor and his family and friends. What you serve? And yeah. fried chicken, mm -hmm. and bread, potatoes, and coleslaw. Said that he gave you a fifty dollar tip once or something I on the profits you made. <laughs> <clears throat> right? Yes, sir. I, I suppose maybe I I gave him as good a price as I could and still maybe not lose on it in order to try to get the business and get to say I had served the governor or had served at the governor's mansion. And uh, it happened that I did not make anything on it service and when I got a fifty dollar tip from the governor himself well that was the profit and it was uh, so important significant to me that I didn't forget it I never will that I got fifty dollars from the governor of Georgia. Did he uh, support you during any of your efforts to uh, when you ran for uh, mayor of Atlanta? No sir. Not at all? Mm, I don't recall. How about in uh, the election of 62, both of you lost, uh, why? Well, I was running against the establishment, and I had never been in a statewide campaign. And I don't know why a government 
with in laws, unless maybe uh, the image that had been projected about his previous administration and the things that had occurred during that time, I think that probably had more do, to do with it than anything else. And then the major media was against him. And of course, all the liberals and the radicals, and uh, they were against him. And that's a pretty powerful group. I think people were against him or against you, weren't they? Generally speaking. But you put them all together, that's a big powerful group. And uh, what you call the political establishment, they supported uh, young Carl Sanders. Yeah. Well, I, I thought it was you. remarkable that a boy from Hemphill Avenue, a fellow from Hemphill Avenue in Atlanta, part of the Atlanta, native Atlanta, the only native Atlanta never elected governor, the only one ever elected lieutenant governor. I thought it re was remar remarkable that I would get in a statewide campaign uh, against people like Peyton Hawes, and Peter Zach Gill, and uh, there are other various ones that were in there at the time, and that I would beat them all in the primary except Peter Zach Gill. And I think the difference was that Peter Zach Gill lined up with Carl Sanders, and I didn't. They weren't too compatible ideologically. No, but it got to be a strictly political thing in the primary runoff. And uh, Peter Zach made his arrangements with Carl Sanders, and I was certainly an outsider, unknown to most politicians at the Capitol, and, and I don't suppose I knew five of them myself uh, at the State Capitol. I, I doubt seriously if I knew five people in 1962 at the Georgia State Capitol. I did know Peter Zach Gill, and I knew Marvin Griffin and Ernest Vanderbilt. And I didn't get to you know, know Carl Sanders until uh, the governor's race in 66. And he stated to me, uh, no, it was in 62 when I met him. He stated to me at Jekyll Island that he keeps hearing more and more about uh, Sanders and Maddox mm -hmm. win. Mm -hmm. And I responded back to him that I hear a whole lot also about Griffin and Maddox. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you and Marvin didn't consult during the campaign? I, no, sir, not about political activity. Why is that? Uh, typically in Georgia, each person tends to his own garden. They don't team up. I don't know whether that's true always or not. But generally, it is. I was still an outsider, politically speaking, doing that race. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think maybe that's more cause for than anything else. But I tended, even doing that, doing that race, I attended Marvin Griffin rallies in mm -hmm. places like Augusta, Cartersville, and uh, down in Lawrence County, Dublin, Georgia, mm -hmm. and uh, America's Georgia. I attended the Sanders meeting over in Statesboro, Virginia and I, she's here now. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the fly over there with somebody on the plane that afternoon and we missed the airplane, so we flew over there in my Mercury station wagon. <laughs> and I didn't get in time to get into the meeting. George Wallace was there and, and uh, Governor Griffin was there. So I just worked out front of the stadium there in America, Georgia, with passing out literature and so forth. And I attended both the Carl Sanders opening and the Marvin Griffin opening on, on their opening days. They happened to have them both at the same time. Why is it that uh, Marvin, for example, yourself, and several other Georgia, uh, Georgia politicians of recent years have traditionally throughout their campaign, campaigned against the big cities and against the big city newspapers in particular, and certainly the newspapers are not supported. But I've never campaigned against big cities. I have campaigned against the political establishment. Uh, a lot of it's dishonest and biased, unfair, and prejudiced. Uh, they're human beings. You've got good and bad blacks and good and white whites good and bad whites, I mean, and good and bad Democrats, good and bad Republicans. You've got good and bad people in the media. 
<laughs> you got a milk bush, good and bad. But the, the media, the liberal media, because of being unjust and unfair, and through human instinct of wanting to get their own side across, and oftentimes they can see no good in a person mm -hmm. they don't support. Well, I suppose that is. And, and no bad in the person they do support. And we're seeing a lot of examples this day in the pres presidential race. We're seeing, if you speak an unfavorable truth mm -hmm. about a candidate that is liked, then there's a lot of, you can make an enemy out of a person, or, or there's a lot of object objections raised. Now, if you speak an unfavorable untruth about a candidate that an individual doesn't like, then he's your buddy. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's the same way in the news media. Uh, I suppose it's unfair, though. It, it, would be, it would be great if, uh, in some way or another, the media could be fair and objective. But being human beings, I don't know whether it's ever possible to live or occur. Do you suppose that the, the race issue is what's hurt a large number of politicians uh, in the South. I've noticed, especially in, Mar in Marvin's case, uh, and to some extent your own, that if you can wipe right away the dialogue and the diatribe that goes along and what the newspapers say, et cetera, that once the administration has occurred, you look back on it, there are an awful lot of progressive things that happen that are tangible and very clear. Why do you suppose the, the predominance of race keeps popping up, even though it's no longer a factor? Well, I think, I think again, that some of the political establishment and the, and the global media breed this kind of thinking in order to mislead and misinform uh, the electorate and to play their own sides. Uh, I think sometimes they become almost obsessed with it. Well, in your own administration, for example, we got a number of things uh, Prison reform, uh, continued uh, upper uh, movement of education, university system, and so forth. These are very progressive kinds of things. And yet, uh, we talk to some of the people in the press, and all I can remember is race and, and uh, silly kinds of things, you know, that, that happen to get votes, to get attention. And they concentrate on that and don't dwell on the substance of the issue. Well, I believe that, you know, there's some good and bad in all people. But a lot of people who try to form public opinion and write their own views and feelings and expression and analysis rather than facts are just, uh, just unable to see any good and like I say in the first that they're fools. Yes, and uh, if, if regardless of how much good he does, mm -hmm. it, it never gets into their thinking. Speaking of education, we we accomplished more in higher education over the matter of school years, percentage-wise, so far as the budget is concerned, than any other state in the United States. We got 50 states, and Georgia led the field for four years. And that's yeah, I'm aware of that. I've been. And it, it's <laughs> secondary, elementary and secondary education. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been any, anything before or since that equaled it. Marvin did real And in well, penal reform, right. in penal reform, nothing to ever compare with it. Uh, there's never been any cleanup in the penal system in this state. Mm -hmm. And so far as employment is concerned, uh, you take the, uh, the uh, uh, Carl Sanders had put two people, two black people on the selective service boards. Mm -hmm. No one else had ever put them on. Mm -hmm. I put on 38 within six months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was all around like that. They opened tight the government, the, uh, the industrial growth. Mm -hmm. they, now, if you listen to the people who set up the media. Mm -hmm. uh, they projected that the world would end if I got elected. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there'd be rioting, burning, schools closing, mm -hmm. crime would take over. And all those things. So if, yeah, if, if I got elected. And everything went right the opposite of what they had forecast. But they never did it, admit it. You were in favor of doing uh, your lieutenant governorship uh, for uh, an income tax, or pardon me, a sales tax increase? Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, Governor Carter was not. 
And uh, let me see, did you meet with him in the committee on a Sunday evening at the governor's mansion during the time that was being funded? When he was trying to raise taxes, mm -hmm. I met with him. I just wanted to verify something Emmy Thompson told me. He said that he had called right prior to that and offered his advice to Mr. Carter and that uh, Carter had indicated that he was going to meet with you in a committee on Sunday at the governor's mansion and he intended to support uh, the increase in the sales tax. And then uh, the next day he didn't, sometime the next hour or two or whenever he changed his mind. And then he contends he lied to him. He does that every day. The well, well, more he does, the more votes he gets. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can understand that. My proposal was a uh, half of some of the <coughs> one cent sales tax on the local government, cities and counties, mm -hmm. and a half percent of it. Some of Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. But it automatic rolled back and have rolled taxes. Mm -hmm. and try to cut down this filing increase in, in uh, have rolled taxes. But and uh, half of it was on there. The other, uh, the other half, Mm -hmm. uh, some 60% of the other half would have gone into education, 40% of the how did, how did you use the GBI? I didn't use it. Not at all? Uh, occasionally we get some requests, you know, to, for mm -hmm. some special investigations if the department felt like they ought to get into Where the requests like come from? Fine. Well, sometimes they come from a prosecuting official, but generally they would come from a from the private people. Did the, uh... It's just like one senator wanted to, wanted to, one of his, in his district, one of his counties, he wanted a revenue department, not part unit, tax unit, to a greater place, probably wind up closing down. But, the revenue department knew that the, a lot of people in the same county were up to get the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so they offered at the time to go on in there and, and hit this place, but going to hit all these others too. Mm -hmm. And the senator that wanted that one particular one hit, when you found out he was going to hit the others, he didn't want any of them hit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just one that, when he found out he was mad with some woman there. Mm -hmm. Really wanted to <laughs> her. Read that one, so we got that request. A lot of times you get it from a senator or a representative or, or some county official, but primarily uh, uh, citizens themselves about maybe a murder that hasn't been solved, or they think people laying down on the job, or about uh, illegal alcohol activities in the neighborhood. Gambling, that kind of thing? Yes, the citizens themselves. Uh, I just wondered because uh, the files that I have, uh, it's very apparent that uh, it was used for uh, other purposes in terms of spying on people and that kind of thing, you know, uh, organizations and snapping photographs and that kind of thing. During uh, at least one administration, I was wondering if that was kind of a constant stuff. Uh, Not that I know of. We, uh, Who does the GBI take its orders from? The governor directly or through uh, what agency or individual? I don't, I wouldn't think it actually takes orders from anyone. I think that with the influence of the governor's office would have an mm -hmm. effect upon it if I were uh, head of the GBI. Mm -hmm. And of course, at that time, the uh, GBI worked under the, the Colonel of Public Safety. Today, it's a separate unit out from the Colonel of Public Safety. And these orders are supposed to come from the director from the Colonel. Mm -hmm. You had your uh, patrol commander. Law and the traffic enforcement, and then you had your GBI, you had another one. Let me ask this uh, are there any particular incidents that stand out in your mind during Marvin's administration? Anything that happened, or personalities, or humorous kinds of things? Yes, knowing that he was over there ready to throw it, some throwing need to be done. Yeah. What do you think his very strength was? And, and that I think the strength was, was in it, 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 it having the courage to say what ought to be said. And uh, I, I admire anyone that fights back at the powers that be. And Marvin Griffin had to beat him to be governor. And uh, he never did become their boy. 
Carl Sanders was an instrument intended that uh, one of the major reasons why he won in 62 was because of his effective use of uh, uh, the mass media, and particularly TV. Uh, in view of that, and I think it's a bit of substance to that issue. Uh, do you think, uh, or would you evaluate yourself and Marvin kind of simultaneously as sort of the last of the breed of, of politicians? By that I mean uh, people who are uh, excellent at the, on the stump, uh, you know, working one to one in the crowd, that kind of thing, as opposed to the image of television. I don't think so because I think Jimmy Carter is, uh, even though he's an option, mm -hmm. politically, mm -hmm. philosophically speaking. Uh, I think that as far as, uh, uh, well, without that in his hand to hand and in the communities like you're talking mm -hmm. about and his supporters working that way, he would not be in the position he is today. So uh, I don't think. What we're talking about, though, when you analyze a certain administration, such as your own or Marvin's uh, and others, uh, you get a, a very, uh, you get a good, a good bit of, of real fiber there. You get a good bit of substance. Uh, and uh, yet, in the case of Carr, this is what really amazing to me is that there isn't a whole lot. Most of it, I think one of my friends put it, is fluff. Uh, there's, there's nothing there. There's nothing to reorganization. There's nothing to zero-based budgets. There's nothing to reform. There's two, two no-growth years in the university system. During his administration, Atlanta becomes the number one murder capital in America, on and on and on. Interstate 75 is not complete. There's, there's very little substance there, you know, but yet he's very pleasing on, on the tube, you know, smiling at the kind of stuff. Well, you mentioned that. Carl Sanders and mm -hmm. his uh, use of the media, mm -hmm. but I think far greater than so far as his uh, final victory was concerned. I think far greater than his use of the media was the media's use of Carl Sanders. Mm How -hmm. so? Uh, uh, all the constant, continuous, favorable mm -hmm. support, the news coverage. Did you know so Carl that? Sanders? Uh, all of it favorable, nothing unfavorable. I don't ever call it anything unfavorable. The, and nothing favorable about, about Marvin Griffin and everything unfavorable. I think that had more to do with it than whatever he spent on television radio himself. How about the uh, people, people themselves so far as the situation now with, with Jimmy Carter, speaking of reorganization, and he tells the people that he's going to cut down to so many agencies, departments, he didn't do away with the one in Georgia. They just were integrated into uh, a massive umbrella organization. They're still all there. Right. Didn't eliminate no jobs, just created more. Right. And so, it, and he tells the people he'd save $50 million the first year. Actually, the first year in the reorganization, the budget jumped $343 million, which was more than the three previous combined years. He says he cut administrative costs 50%. No governor's ever cut administrative costs, even 10%. Mm -hmm. Why are you supposed to believe it? And people believe it. Why? Now, because uh, of the press? No governor, not just in Georgia, no other governor anywhere in the mm -hmm. country has cut administrative costs 50%. Mm -hmm. Well, the facts are that under his administration, when he left office, there were more than three times as many people making above 20,000 than all other governors in the history of the state. Mm -hmm. And when he gained office, when well, he left office with more than three, three times many people making 20000 above annually, and when he gained office, which mm -hmm. is to say that he, he increased it more than three times in all the rest of the history of the state. Now, on $343 million jump in increase, he tells people he saved $50 million. Mm -hmm. And that $343 million is more than the combined increases for three years prior to that time. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. People just don't seem to care. Well, I don't. This is, this bothers me more than misleading, deceiving, dishonest politicians, or even corrupt public officials. How do you get people to care? I don't know. I wish I knew. I'm a. This concerns me more than any other one single thing on the political scene. What about uh, polls? Did you use polls in your campaign? I don't recall one. No sir. I don't, you mean hire somebody to take a poll? Right. Okay. No sir. The reason why I ask, uh, Sanders did in 62, and he didn't believe them. Uh, and yet CBS, uh, fully a week or 10 days before the election was actually held, were down here to hear filming him, uh, maybe because they supported him or thought he was going to win, because the polls all indicated that he was going to win. He wasn't sure, he told me, until that night. 
you know, until it actually came in. Now, I think he's probably telling the truth. Um, well, I, I don't have uh, much else. Uh, he's given me some more information. Well, I'm glad I thought was in that Channel 11, the night of election. And I thought for sure, either night of the election or the night before, I thought for sure he was going to win that late, even though the polls indicated I, that I had heard of otherwise. But Marvin Griffin didn't think he was going to win that night. I think he had given up. Evidently, he had a poll. Or he had read someone else because he was, he was down that night. And I think it was the night before. Not the day of the election, but the night before. But I told him, I said, well, I'm going to win, and you're going to win, too. He said, I wish I could feel that way. So he must have had something on the inside. It kind of got me down a little bit after talking with him, because he evidently uh, knew something I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, your, your, your loss was a lot closer than his. It was pretty well, I lost 190,000 votes. Well, not that many, but I mean, yeah, black votes, I lost 190,000. I won the white votes. I lost the color of black. You know, that's another crazy thing. And I told it in my book, that I put more blacks in private positions than all governors in the history of the state. And I told the department heads, don't you hire anyone that's not qualified. And even if they're qualified, don't you hire them unless you have a job. Mm -hmm. And that was contrary to, right the opposite of what the department heads had always been told. Mm -hmm. And I said, if I got a friend come to you for a job and he's qualified and you have a job and he's the best qualified, you hire him. But if he comes to you and doesn't, you don't have a job. Or if you've got a job and he's not the best qualified, still don't hire him. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, I don't care whether it be black or white or Republicans or Democrats. Mm -hmm. And so that's the way I worked for those four years in that position. And through, through these efforts, through this open door policy, the open governor's office, and open employment, we did put more blacks in positions than all governors combined. And they came to all the candidates this time, and their demand was that we restructure the marriage system in order to give blacks a priority. Well, I recognize that blacks have been cheated, discriminated against, and whites have too in many instances. Mm -hmm. and I can remember when blacks had to come to your back door with a hat in their hand. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad we don't have to have anybody do those type things anymore. And so I went all out, not because people were black, because they were white, but it didn't make any difference to me because they were all Georgians. And they wanted to restructure the marriage system, and I said, so they could favor one group. And, and I refused. George agreed to do so. I said, I'm going to continue to hire everybody we can hire, your people, white people, who are the best qualified. Who gave you that advice? Nobody gave me that advice. Who did you lean on? The black, the the black leaders, nobody. The black leaders came to me, you know. King? We had a meeting. What was it? A dozen or more of them. And uh, I said, you can, I, I'll be honest with you, open with you, and here's what we've done already. I promise you we'll continue to see that nobody's cheated within my ability to finish. But I'm not going to hire people that are not qualified for jobs that we haven't done. Sort of like the uh, airport situation? I, I do that in my business every now and then, but it's by mistake. It's not on purpose. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, to have done that, I would have either had to, to commit myself to these people that I was going to do that, I didn't have to be sitting there lying to them. Or if I did that, then I'd have to be cheating good people, black people and white people with the taxpayers, so the ones that were qualified. So I refused to do it. They cost me 190,000 votes. But I'd still rather be lost, even though my campaign debt today is even greater than my gross salary for years. I'd really rather have lost than still told them the truth of my own feelings and the want either cheated a lot of other people or lied to those people. That's basically